you some things that maybe you wish your parents did with you growing up, so you'd want to take them here, or do, take them there, maybe let them experience this, or make sure they have this, or maybe give them a little bit more things or toys. There's something about that that we just want to give them a better life than we had growing up. The other aspect, and like I know much about parenthood, but there are things that, even from my end, that we pass on to people that are younger. Whether it be our children, whether it's nieces, nephews, people would pass things on to them. And as we think about that, I'm sure, Brother Dennis, you probably taught Terry, for the most part, how to work on the mechanics of cars and stuff like that. And if I were to ask you if he was able to diagnose a vehicle better than you or figure something out quicker, I'm sure that that wouldn't bother you in any way. I mean, it's your son, you taught him how to do things. You want him to excel and be, do great at what he does. I'm sure, sure we would ask Hannah or Elizabeth about their banking skills. Who taught you guys how to bake? Your mom. And somebody taught your mom how to bake. And I'm sure that if Elizabeth can bake something better than Sister Peterman can, or Hannah would cook or bake something better than Sister Peterman, and we asked her right out, would that bother you if they could do something much better than you? But in order to teach them those things, first, they had to be taught. They were things that they were experiencing, pain growing up or something that somebody showed them. The same thing is true in our own life. If I'm sure there's things that we can go back and think and say, hey, my parents or my grandparents taught me how to do this. And you know what? I can do a whole lot better than they could, but they have no qualms with it. In fact, they encourage it. Or if there's um, times I know my grandmother will say, hey, Stacy, will you bake this or bake this? Because I'm no good at it. When it comes to God and the Holy Ghost, you realize that the baptism of the Holy Ghost is slowly becoming a thing of the past. And we're slowly falling and drifting back into those old, dark days where perhaps they used to cut holes in the ceilings of the churches and release doves um, symbolizing the, um, or at least them coming down, symbolizing the day of the Pentecost. We're getting back to the point where we find ourselves back even during the days of Bethel Bible School where they are sitting around discussing what is the baptism of the Holy Ghost because at some point it lost complete meaning. And then we are slowly getting that way. How do we know that we are slowly getting that way? Because there came a point in time when all the gifts of the Spirit were in operation in a church at one time, because that was the, the intent that God had. For the, not just tongues, not just interpretation, not just prophesying, but somebody having the working of miracles, the gifts of healing, discernment of spirits. When was the last time you met somebody that you know of with the discernment of spirits, or the gift of faith, or the working of miracles, any gift besides interpretation, tongues, and prophecy? When was the last time? Is there anybody in your, life, in your life, even right now, that you can think of that has that gift? Now, I realize some of the gifts may not be right out there, and the person that is used in the gift of faith or uh, discernment of spirits, you know, it's a little bit less hit uh, evident because it's not going to be one of those public display gifts because they can pick it out unless you're close to them and they tell you that this is this. You might not be aware of it, but the gifts are slowly dwindling. And along with the gifts, so is the baptism of the Holy Ghost. And when we look at the baptism of the Holy Ghost, who's it for? It is for the believer. Is it for just some of the believers? It is for all the believers. So right now we're going to step back. We're going to do a quick exercise. It's going to be painless. And I realize some of us already have the baptism of the Holy Ghost with evidence and speaking in other tongues. But that does not mean that we don't need a second filling. So we're going to go around the room one by one, say me, and I'm going to ask you who the baptism of the Holy Ghost is for, and with a sincere heart, and just thinking within yourself. And even if sometimes we just have to step back and take a breath, you know what, this is really for me. Despite the exercise, this is really for me. Daniel, who's the baptism of the Holy Ghost with the evidence of tongues for? But it's for I don't know. Me. It's for you. Me. Brother Eli, who's the baptism of the Holy Ghost with evidence of tongues for? It's for you. Brother 
God who is the baptism of the Holy Ghost for? For you. Sister Tina? For you. Brother Craig? Sister Peter? Elizabeth? It is for you. Even at this age, when you accept Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, it is already for you. Lacey, who is the baptism of the Holy Ghost? It is for you. It is the baptism of the Holy Ghost with the evidence of other tongues. Anna? Sister Dog? Me. Mom? I'm sorry, I'm horrible with names. Lynn. I was going to say Lynn. You were right. Me. It is for you. Brother Dennis? Me. Sister Beth? It is for me. The baptism of the Holy Ghost and the evidence of other tongues is for me. So the question is, what are we going to do with that now? Because it is our decision. What, when it comes to the baptism of the Holy Ghost, John chapter 14 and 26, if someone would please read that. So the Comforter will come. And we know that it came on Acts chapter, and when we're, let me just back up before we get to Acts chapter 2 4. If someone will please hold Acts 2 4 and get ready to read that. Let's jump back to John chapter 14 right now. Who's Jesus speaking to? Well, in the Bible, yes, but we're going back to the Bible times, going in context with that verse. In this passage right here, not personally speaking, but who is Jesus directly speaking to and telling at that point in time that the Father is going to send the Comforter for him. For the disciples. And if we go back into this time frame, there's one more verse that best describes us, and it best describes our experience from when we have salvation and before the baptism and after. And he says that the Holy Ghost is with you. And if we go back to salvation, the Holy Ghost is with us. Because when we feel God moving in a service, before salvation, I never felt him inside me. I always felt him outside me. I felt the Holy Ghost goosebumps and stuff like that. Not saying that I didn't feel conviction, but when he was present, I felt him on the outside of my body. But when I got the baptism of the Holy Ghost, he was with me before, but there came a time when he was going to be in them. And that's what the baptism of the Holy Ghost is. is that change from the Holy Ghost just being with you and you feeling those Holy Ghost goosebumps to him being in you and all of a sudden you feel him flowing throughout your extremities. And I don't say that lightly. I mean, you physically feel the Holy Ghost flowing up through your arms, your hands, and he's swirling in your stomach. You can feel him in you. You laugh, Sister Tina, but it, it's the truth, though. There have been plenty of times in the service I felt the Holy Ghost running up inside, down the inside of my arms, not the outside, but you know you can feel him in you. And then we get to Acts chapter 2 4, which states. And they were all filled with the Holy Ghost and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. There is a difference with the Holy Ghost experience with, during salvation and your experience with Him after um, the baptism of the Holy Ghost with the evidence of other tongues. And when I say what... Um, when we talk about the baptism of the Holy Ghost, it is a free gift that is meant for every single believer out there. Now, I, I, I hope that everything's making sense because I'm, I feel like I'm this way. But when we look at the baptism of the Holy Ghost, if we are going to receive Him and receive the baptism, it comes down to surrender. And this leads to another reason I believe that we're going to see a decline in the baptism of the Holy Ghost unless people really get on fire for God, we really see a revival, is because if you talk about the baptism of the Holy Ghost and uh, which gender mostly has it, it doesn't matter which church for the most part, it's mostly women. And I've had this discussion with another Pentecostal in the past, and the reason she thought, the reason that women had it for the most part was because from little on up, you were taught to you had to be obedient and submissive to your father, and from there you are taught you had to be obedient and submissive to your parents and 
a pastor and authority, and then you were being trained because you knew when you got married, you had to be obedient and submissive to your husband to be um, as well because you were under that headship. So for the aspect of women and, well, female, girls, you're all the way trained up. That was the mentality. So when it came to receiving the baptism of the Holy Ghost and you had to surrender all to him, it was just another aspect of, okay, I had to submit to another authority. Whereas men were raised, well, you know, the head of your house, you got to do this, you got to do that. So it sometimes becomes harder for guys to get the baptism of the Holy Ghost because it is a surrendering process. And it is a matter of surrendering everything to God, not just one aspect or surrendering everything and holding one thing back, but it is a full and complete surrender. And sometimes we do have difficulty surrendering absolutely everything to God. But in order to get the baptism of the Holy Ghost, we must be willing to surrender everything for God. But it is a free gift to the believer. And it is evidenced by the speaking in other tongues. What does Mark chapter 16 and verse 17 state? Honda and say speak as fast as you 
again, until all of a sudden it comes out, I bada hada, bada hada, bada hada. That is not the baptism of the Holy Ghost. It is a gift from God, and it cannot be manufactured by man. Now, before I continue on, because I'm losing time, um, also keep in mind, if you're talking in the back of your head, the devil has a handle on the gifts of God and a mock of them. He can mimic them. And if we are not careful and we are not walking like we should be and living close to God and trying to get close to God because he said, my sheep know my voice, we can be led astray because the devil will make something sound good but all it takes is one small slight twist, and if you're not paying attention, you can miss it. And that makes it a lie. And the devil has a handle and a mock on the gifts of God. But why do I need the baptism of the Holy Ghost? First of all, it's a free gift. Why wouldn't you want it? It is a gift from God. Second of all, it is not the only gift from God. There are other gifts that come along with the baptism of the Holy Ghost. If someone would please read 1 Corinthians chapter 12 and verse 11. 1 Corinthians 12, 11. The Holy Ghost gives how many gifts to men that receive the baptism of the Holy Ghost? Nine. Well, not everybody gets all nine, brother. He didn't say you'll you have all nine. If you want to be greedy and pray for more, that's all right. But he said that he'll give them how many, brother? Several. Several. So he'll give to them who receive the baptism of the Holy Ghost severally as he will. So keep in mind that it's not just enough to get the baptism of the Holy Ghost, but he has gifts for us to use. And it's a matter of then praying, God, teach me how to use these gifts and go deeper in you. The next thing, why do I need this gift? Because if you don't receive the baptism of the Holy Ghost, and I don't get the baptism of the Holy Ghost, and Brother Eli don't get the baptism, and our kids don't get the baptism, well, then there's nobody to show that our grandkids the baptism of the Holy Ghost. And when we die off, all those things that were common in the church during the times of the Apostle are lost once again. And we're right back at Bethel Bible School. I think it was 1901 where they were praying, God, what is this thing and is it for today? Because the thing is, as much as we criticize the Sadducees and the Pharisees, there's one thing about them that we cannot deny that the church world today has lost. They knew when somebody was demon-possessed, and we can't tell. For the most part, probably, they pass us every single day, and we have no clue. But if we would have went back during their time, and we could criticize the Sadducees and the Pharisees, well, they do everything to be seen, and they pray on the street corner, beating their chest. But they knew when somebody was demon-possessed. Is that something that we can even say in today's church? So why do I need the baptism of the Holy Ghost? Because we need somebody, if we don't have it, how can we teach our children? How can we teach our grandchildren? How can we tell them when they get up here praying for the Holy Ghost and what it is? That stammering look, you're not there yet. You need to push forward a little bit more. The other thing, too, is when it comes to baptism of the Holy Ghost and the gift, how can we explain and teach somebody something that we don't know what it is in the first place? When it comes to the gifts of the Spirit, it's hard to teach on the gifts of the Spirit when you're used in some of them, much less when you haven't been used in it. It's hard to explain it. It's hard to describe what it is. And on top of that, God moves on everybody differently. So if we are not willing to be used of God to get the baptism of the Holy Ghost, if we're not pushing forward, if we're not willing to say, God, give me the gift, uh, reveal to me what gifts you have for me in my life, those gifts that you've given me, and teach me how to use them, and don't just, it's not just a matter of teaching me, you realize there's a place that we need to keep going deeper and deeper and deeper in that gift, learning it more and more and more. God, teach me in my own life how to be used in this gift more effectively. And it comes back to, if we don't go there, if we don't learn, 
the gifts of the Spirit. If we don't allow God to teach us, how are we going to teach the next generation? It's not just enough that we're losing um, the next generation to the world or the church is getting more and more worldly. But we're losing those spiritual gifts that God's given to the church. The baptism of the Holy Ghost. We're losing the gifts of the Spirit. They're, the only thing we have going on, and I could be wrong, but the only thing I ever see is tongues, interpretation, prophecy. Who has the gifts of discernment of Spirit? Who has the gifts of healing? Who has the gift of prophecy? Well, not prophecy, but um, of faith. And the rest of the nine gifts. Who, where are they? Like I said, some of these are hidden, but if we don't have these gifts going in our own lives, if we don't have these gifts going on in our own church, how can we instruct the future generation on how to be using them, how to get them, acquire them? I realize it's a matter of them doing close to God as well and learning from God, the master, but how can we even guide them into those things if we don't know what they are in the first place? But those that have the baptism of the Holy Ghost, like I said, the Holy Ghost is for everybody who believes. And the gifts are for those who receive the baptism. Why do I need the Holy Ghost? Because He will guide us into all truth. John 16, 13. And I'm quickly running out of time. And I'm only on page 1 of 4. So I doubt we're getting all the way through. But why would God use the tongue? Why the evidence of speaking in other tongues? If we go back to the very, very, very beginning... We find one man, one woman, in a garden, all alone, a snake with legs that talks. And it's not the snake that deceived the man. The man willfully took because of the woman. The woman was deceived, but man wasn't. And when Adam partook the fruit, he lost everything. He lost the garden. He lost the inheritance of the earth because earth belonged to man. Earth was man's dominion. When the Bible talks about you shall be as uh, they were as gods in the book of Psalms, in a sense they were gods of this world because they ruled it. They were over it. They controlled it. Yes, God was the head and over it, but man controlled the earth. That was his inheritance. That is the seven sealed book in the Revelation. If you study it out, that is the title deed to the earth that Christ opens up because he bought it back with the price of his precious blood because man lost it. What is the purpose of the gift? To restore back a little bit that man has lost. The gift that he laid. When Adam sinned, death and sin entered into the world. Before that, man lived forever. But death, disease, thorns, thistles, all of that was part of the curse. But when it comes to the gift, God's giving back a little bit of what man's lost. If we go back, if we skip forward a little bit from Adam in Genesis chapter 11, we find man gathering himself together. He spoke one language. It probably wasn't English. So sorry to upset your theology. But they spoke one language. And God told man to scatter after Noah's ark. Rest on Mount Hera. But what did man do? He talked amongst himself. And they gathered themselves together because of their speech. If you study how they claim that Nimrod was a great orator. We see that part of the uh, one characteristic of the spirit of Antichrist. We see that when we study the book of Daniel, that the Antichrist himself will be a great orator. We've seen the Fear of Antichrist at work, um, even within history, and maybe even your own lives. What did Adolf Hitler do? He was a tremendous speaker. He captivated audiences the whole time. Why? Because the spirit of Antichrist was working in their midst and working through him. And because of the tongue where man gathered himself together, God said, All right, enough. I'm going to diversify your language. I'm going to make it difficult for you to communicate with each other. So God used the human tongue to divide and separate mankind. But at Pentecost, God was unifying the church, the church which is not confined, founded to, or confined to just Chinese language or English language or uh, 
Swahili language, but rather he was bringing them together because the body of Christ is diversified and scattered across the entire world. And God uses a tongue at Pentecost to unite people. All those in the upper room, they spoke different dialects and different languages. Yes, they might have had one that they could communicate as a national tongue, but they all spoke different languages. And God used the human tongue to unify people. That thing that he once used to separate people because they used it to unite themselves against God. God said, all right, I'm going to restore it back to you once again and use the tongue to unite the church. We know the tongue is powerful and it can control the whole body according to James chapter 3 and 1 through 6. And James 3 and verse 8 states that you can't control your tongue. I can't control my tongue. It's evidence, I'm sure, in all of our workplaces when we're in the secular world. You look at the sinner, they definitely can't control their tongues. Why? Because the tongue can no man tame. But what happened at Pentecost? Did man control his tongue at Pentecost? No. That thing that man could not control, God showed, I will control it. And that is what happens during the baptism of the Holy Ghost. And that is why tongues is the evidence. Because that last member that no man has control over, we finally surrender and say, God, everything I have is yours. When we finally get to that point, a complete surrender, then that tongue is part of it. God uses our tongue as the evidence of speaking of, of, the, of the baptism. And it is a supernatural occurrence. And not only is it supernatural that God controls the tongue, but it is a supernatural language that comes out of us because it's not something I know. And it won't be something that you know. It is a language that is completely unknown to us. And, they, and I just have in our notes, just keep in mind when we speak of the baptism with other tongues, that this tongue, and the tongue that you hear people praying in and worshiping in is completely different than the gift of tongues. And that is extremely important to keep in mind because that is one of the biggest hang-ups that people have or misunderstanding when it comes to reading the Bible because we read that God has given us tongues. Uh, there's come a time where tongues shall cease. All of a sudden, 1 Corinthians, uh, I think it's 1 Corinthians uh, yeah, 13, we're given instruction about tongues. And it can be confusing. I realize that. But it's important to realize that there's two different things. There's the gift of tongues, but then there's the tongues that comes with the baptism that is our prayer language is what we've come to call it. It is entirely different. If a person claims that they have received the baptism of the Holy Ghost and there has been no tongues, they did not receive the baptism of the Holy Ghost. The baptism of the Holy Ghost has always been evidenced by the speaking in other tongues. A person who is not saved cannot get the baptism. If they do, I can tell you which baptism they received, but it did not come from God. It came from the devil. Because once again, he has his own and all the gifts. You've got to keep in mind the devil has his own followers, his own worshipers. When a person receives Christ as their personal Savior, they have received a small portion of their inheritance, which is a portion of the whole. When he goes, we find that in Ephesians chapter 1, 13 and 14. And that is completely different than the baptism of the Holy Ghost. Because when the baptism of the Holy Ghost comes, it is God filling us. Submission and surrender to God is futile or is important in receiving the baptism of the Holy Ghost with the evidence of other tongues because you can ask anybody in here that has received the baptism of the Holy Ghost and we could not keep anything in our own life. In fact, what kept me from getting the baptism of the Holy Ghost, of the Holy Ghost for the longest time was because I wanted to keep control of a small portion of my life. It wasn't sin, it wasn't bad, but I wanted control of it. And if you ask anybody in this room when it comes to getting the baptism of the Holy Ghost, it came when we got ourselves in a place 
of complete surrender to God. Then and only then were we able to receive the baptism of the Holy Ghost with the evidence of speaking in other tongues. I am not going to read the history of speaking in other tongues. What is the purpose of the baptism of the Holy Ghost? Well, there are several purposes. It is to empower the believer. We find this in Acts chapter 1 and verse 8. All this is in your notes. Listen, I'm running out of time, and that's why I'm going by so fast. If you have it in your notes, you can go back and reference it. I'm not teaching anything that's not Bible. It's all there. It is to empower the believer to be witnesses to everyone around us, to perform the calling of God in their life. The disciples were commanded to go and tarry until they received the baptism of the Holy Ghost. Then they started their ministries. It is the power to cast out devils, lay hands upon the sick and see them recover, to edify the church through the it is to edify the church in several ways through the fulfilling of your calling, through being used in the gifts of the Spirit, to help us pray for things that we know not. Now while we're here, just keep in mind that when it comes to the baptism of the Holy Ghost, there is no such thing as a bat as a Holy Ghost filled senior, Holy Ghost filled mom, dad, teenager. They are all one of the Holy Ghost. There is only Holy Ghost filled people. And I cannot stress enough that when a person receives salvation and accepts Jesus Christ as a personal Savior, that they are a candidate for the Holy uh, for the baptism of the Holy Ghost with the evidence of speaking in other tongues. No matter the age, which means Elizabeth, you can receive the baptism of the Holy Ghost. And if you accept Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, if you haven't already, you can receive the baptism of the Holy Ghost. Lacey, you can receive the baptism of the Holy Ghost if you really want it. And even if you wanted to, if he's not at that age already, because I think he is, if Josiah accepted Jesus Christ as his personal Savior, right here now, even at his very age, he is a candidate for the baptism of the Holy Ghost. So many times, I think as, as a church, we think about ages, and we, even if not intentionally, we label it that, well, maybe they're not quite ready yet. But the moment that they receive salvation, regardless of age, if they can accept Jesus Christ as their personal Savior, they're ready for the baptism of the Holy Ghost. And when I say ready, they're a candidate. If they're ready, that's between them and God. They need to make sure that they are surrendered, that they are ready. Because you're the mom, the dad, the Sunday school teacher, the youth group, pastor. Nobody can make them get the baptism of the Holy Ghost. That is their relationship with God. And when I, and if they're a candidate for the baptism of the Holy Ghost and they receive it, regardless of age, once again, they are able to be used in the gifts of the Spirit. That's kind of why we went through that exercise early on, because I think sometimes we get ourselves in a rut and we get this mindset and that mindset. But why do we need the baptism of the Holy Ghost? Because A, frankly, we need it for our own relationship with God. We really do. We need it for our own walk with God. But how can we teach our children, our grandchildren, and the future of the church about spiritual things if we don't know for ourselves, if we're not experiencing them for ourselves, if we don't have them working in our own life. Who's going to take the lead? Because when we look in, I think it's the book of Jeremiah, do you remember when Jeremiah said that God placed a calling on his life? Even far in the child, while he was still in the womb, the moment a person is born, God may have already placed a calling on that child's life. Which means, for all I know, even as young as Ezra is, maybe God has called him to a specific task. Maybe he's called him to be an apostle, even though he's not even saved yet. Maybe God has called him to something specific. For all we know, right back there is sitting maybe a prophetess, or a prophet, or an apostle. But if we are not familiar with God, if we are not familiar with spiritual things, how can we try to guide them in the ministry that they have? How can we even recognize that maybe God has already placed a calling on their life and is already preparing them? 
for all we know, that God's already been speaking to Josiah in an audible voice, even if he's not told anybody. Or Hannah, or Elizabeth, or Lacey. I remember God started talking to me at the age of 10 about things in the future. I remember people talking, telling me that God, and hearing preachers talk about God was speaking to them at a younger age of 10. What? If we are not willing go the distance, if we're not willing to receive the baptism of the Holy Ghost, if we're not seeking, because we can get to a point where we get tired and uh, it, it was so much hassle when we try to get there, we, try, we just have it that we just give up. The baptism of the Holy Ghost is for everyone who believes and it's a free gift. And why should we get it? If we shouldn't get it just for us and our walk with God, what about future generations? How can we guide them? How can we teach them? How can we instruct them in things that we know nothing about? Now, we owe it at least to them, because if we don't, we can already see in today's society and in the church world, the gifts, the baptism of the Holy Ghost, they're slowly getting pushed under and pushed under until we get to the point, once again, that they get lost, until somebody gets hungry for God. But shame on us if the church has to get to the point where we are praying, God, once again, reveal to me, what do you mean in Acts 2, 4? Is that today? Shame on us for letting that go by the wayside. That is our responsibility as a church. And we are living in the last days. And you realize that the devil has a counterfeit for anything? And you know the one cure-all to battle counterfeit? Show them the real thing. Show them the real thing. But how can we show them the real thing? How can we show them the true gifts that God has given to the church if we don't know them in the first place? Now, it's not just enough just to receive the baptism of the Holy Ghost, but it's a matter of, God, what gifts do you have for me? Teach me to use them. May I be... And it's not just a matter of using them once or twice, because things happen in church. We miss things sometimes. I realize that. It's a learning process, but Take me deeper in this gift. Show me how to use this gift in such a mighty way. Okay, I'm shutting up. Anybody have any thoughts, questions, anything that they want to add? sure she was in the place of surrender, too. Anyone else? If not, the offering plate is in the back on the communion table if you'd like to put something in the offering plate. I know I don't want to take that away from people. It's not us giving to the churches. us giving to God. And I will never want to deny anyone that blessing.
but why don't we stand across this auditorium and pray? Brother Craig, would you dismiss us in prayer?